Hi, I'm Mark Honeybone from Property Ventures and welcome to our weekly podcast where we interview prominent members of the investment community along with other professionals in the New Zealand property market. This is a free service from Property Ventures so that you can keep current and learn from some of the best around New Zealand. To check us out, take a look at propertyventures.co.nz. We hope you enjoy today's podcast. Hi and welcome back to the latest podcast. Today we have Janet who's a partner at Gilligan Row and Associates where she leads the Professional Trustee Services Division. She holds degrees in accounting and law and is a well-known author and presenter on money and trustee matters. Today we're going to talk about trust, professional trustees and a whole lot of good other stuff. So welcome along Janet. Hello Mark, hello everybody. So people have different reasons for trust or even different meanings of what a trust actually is. So, Janet, what is a trust and why should someone look at having one set up? Excellent question, Mark. Well, first off, uh, trusts are not legal entities as such. It's not like a company, for example. They are a device. Uh, Traditionally, they were thought of as a use in Roman terms. I think of them as a vessel. They're either going to hold assets or you're going to conduct business through them or maybe a bit of both. And people set them up for different reasons. I think in New Zealand, it's definitely for asset protection reasons, protection against creditor claims and relationship claims, for estate planning reasons so that you get to pass your assets from uh, yourself to your loved ones in a safe manner, and of course uh, for tax reasons. Those would be the, uh, the four principal reasons for setting up a trust, I think, in New Zealand. If you have a look from an investor perspective, I can give you a real-life client example of that. I had a client whereby they had gone out and uh, were working for somebody who was putting windows into, into a building, and of course that, that particular person went bust. Our client had been buying the windows from another supplier. He still owed the funds, and of course they came after him. Now, no thought of his own, he couldn't actually pay for those windows that he'd purchased and put in somebody else's house. Eventually, uh, somebody else's building, I should say, eventually it all got sorted out. But quite a different story if his assets hadn't been in trust because the manufacturer of the windows would have come over him personally and have taken all of his assets if they weren't protected in a trust. So straight away that protected himself, yeah, basically, basically because he had the trust set up. Absolutely, the, the trust served its purpose. <laughs> Right. Okay, so there's more than you know one type of trust. Um, some people think it's either family trust or maybe trading trust, and probably the two common ones that people in my world sort of know or have. Um, so what do you deal, deal with and um, in your daily job? What sort of trust do you deal with? Well, there's different types of trust, Mark. I, uh, I deal with discretionary trusts and fixed trusts here at the practice. A discretionary trust is where a trustee has a discretion to bestow a benefit on a beneficiary. A fixed trust is a little different in that beneficiaries have fixed entitlement to the assets and the benefits of the trust. But mostly in our practice, we do deal with discretionary trusts. And those discretionary trusts might take the form of family trusts where they're holding family passive assets, rental trusts where you've got rental properties, trading trusts where you're buying and selling property through, a business trust where you're actually conducting business, you're using it as a true business vehicle, or maybe even an inheritance trust where you're passing assets from one trust, i.e. the family trust, through to uh, a child's trust that you've set up. And the different trusts and uh, the trustee duties will be subjected to different pieces of legislation, of course. So, for example, in a family trust, mostly the, it's individuals that are trustees and they're following the Trustee Act, they're following X, we max, maxims and, of course, the provisions of the trust deed. If you're looking, however, at a trading trust or uh, an investor trust, it's likely that you've got the trust. So clearly trustees have duties and you have to follow the Trustee Act and all of those uh, pieces of legislation and and equity around it. But at the same time, the trustee is likely to be a company. So that then pulls the trustee into the Companies Act regime and all of those duties that the Companies Act set down have to to be honoured and adhered to. Just on that, I know many years ago, I mean, things a few laws were different, and with IRD and how and have you, every man and his dog had a trading trust when they were um, when they started, you know, setting up 
whether it is for trading trading property, that's why I had one set up. It, it, it's, it's not so common that it, that it was five or six years ago. Well, I believe with different trusts, you would have different types of trustees. For my part, I like, I like corporate trustees. I think they give a shield against potential liability. So I like, I like corporate trustees to be involved in the majority of trusts. Probably not so necessary in a family trust holding a family home, but definitely, mm. definitely the other types of trusts. Okay, we'll come back to that later on anyway. Mm. So in my, in my day job, my day-to-day -day job, I help clients with their trusts, clearly look at the issues that they need to look at, weigh up the pros and cons, understand the risk, and work out uh, a strategy to really implement to achieve the things that they want the trust to achieve. And then, of course, there's all of the uh, documentation that needs to be put around that so the trust doesn't become a sham. The other things that I'd do is I'd help clients transfer assets to their trust. It never ceases to amaze me the amount of uh, people that I meet who set up a trust and think their assets automatically get settled into a trust. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly, you've got to make sure that they are moved through to the trust. The insurance is set up, that uh, gifting is carried out. And then if all of your assets are in a trust... That means that there are no assets that you're owning personally at the time of death, so you want to make sure that you've set up what we call a memorandum of wishes, which tells your surviving trustees when you're dead what you want to happen to those assets. And that's usually done with a will at the same time, so that's another function that we have. And then when we're moving through and just sort of administering the trust, we make sure that we've got the correct advice and that annual trustee meetings are held and that registers are set up and compiled like asset and liability registers and beneficiary registers and professional contact registers. And then each year what I like to do for our trust clients is review the financial statements, check that all the minutes and the documents are up to date on the trust file and really have a good review of everything because that is a legal duty that a trustee has is to make sure that they review everything. And, uh, and do that annually on a timely basis. And if right. it's not done... Yeah, and I suppose if that's done, you've got all the facts and figures right absolutely. there. Absolutely. Right there. Then for when yeah. someone puts through an S&P agreement, hmm. you're, um, you're not starting from scratch. We're not starting from scratch. But if it's, if it's done, then you're not... The, you know, the chances of a sham allegation being successful hmm. is, a, be. is really low. And if you have a look at a couple of things that, that, that really we do on a daily basis, a yearly basis, you'll see the benefit of it when, uh, when trouble hits, hits the fan. And an example of that was uh, an accident case that I'd, uh, I'd heard on the news that there'd been a quite a horrific accident down the South Island and Gilligan Row holds such a large trust base that I thought it could be one of ours. So I went back to the office and I had a quick look that night and indeed it was. And that was, I, I explain about this when I'm presenting, that was a case where it was a mother and father and two children. Terrible car accident. He was dead. Uh, all three were in critical care. And, you know, the professional trustee could get hold of that file. We could see who the insurers were. We could see who the guardians of the children were going to be if the mother died. We knew who the bankers were. And we could be right in, you know, in the uh, play of things the following morning, getting hold of the insurers and, and the potential guardians putting the bank on notice, actually taking action. And that's what those registers are about. Of course, if you don't have a professional trustee and none of that work gets done, yeah, and that's it makes some, very difficult. Yeah, and that's certainly some people never think of what happens if the whole family gets wiped out. Where do you go? Where does someone start? So, yeah, great. Um, yeah, so so, uh, so what should the investor, whether they're sitting there listening to this, whether in New Zealand or, or overseas space, we have a few, uh, the expat Kiwis and, uh, and also occasionally foreign buyers, um, yeah, we, we, what should they sort of do or consider having? Mm, good, good point being raised there. And that's really about, uh, about tax residency. Mm. When you are setting up a trust, I think it's important that people understand that the trust is just part of an overall structure. So the structure is king. And any structure, including trust, has to fit uh, an investor or a person's circumstances. And that's just not their circumstances. It's their family circumstances, their financial circumstances, their objectives. And, of course, in all of that, tax residency comes into play. So when we look at our clients here, if an investor uh, has any sort of connection to overseas, we're looking at their residency and we're looking at seeing how strong that is. 
Uh, we're looking at uh, their tax status, and in particular, we're looking at the jurisdiction that will uh, will arise. And that's important because if it's not taken into account, trouble waters such as double taxation on income can occur. So mm. pretty vital that uh, your eyes are open with, with that respect. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, obviously, you, you get and talk to someone like yourself that, that knows... Um, knows the best thing for you, you know, when, when you uh, first start out, and I guess this thing is better when you first start out, not three years into your investment strategies. Absolutely. Well, we live in a global world where people and capital are moving all the time, and you, ju- you just have to have your eyes open with that. Mm. Um, and I think we just sort of you briefly touched early on on the sham side of how you can get done for having a sham trust. Mm-hmm. Um, how important is it then that it is set up properly in the first case? Well, I, I think it's I think it's vital. You need different uh, basis of law to set up structures, which, as I say, include a trust. And those basis of knowledge has got to be law, different types of law, accounting, and clearly tax. And that tends to mean, in my world, that you've got to have uh, at least a couple of degrees, which is law and commerce, and uh, tax on top of that. So it's very helpful to start uh, having those uh, basis of knowledge because it's very difficult to understand where a client is in the scheme of things and where they've got to be and manage that process if you don't, uh, you don't have those knowledge bases around you. Of course, it may well be that the structure has been incorrectly set up uh, initially. Alternatively, it's not an appropriate structure o- over time. Circumstances might change over time. And that means that things have to be corrected or, uh, or changed in some way. That can, of course, uh, result in expense. It can result in tax consequences, not to mention structuring consequences. So in my world, we like to do a job uh, right the very first time. If, a, if the work has to be done, though, uh, our team here can most certainly help you. I think about, when I think about looking at structures and trusts, I think about what can happen when it's not done right. And, uh, you know, the old motto, Cheap can turn out to be expensive. You mm-hmm. can, you can frequently see people come through and they say, "Oh well, you know, it's going to cost me a few dollars to set that up." So I just thought that I could go online and do it myself. An instance of that is where somebody might think that a company they set up is indeed a look-through company, but they either haven't made that election or they haven't made it correctly, and then they've gone ahead and they've deducted PAYE at a reduced rate, only to find out later on the company's not an LTC at all. So. That, of course, involves a tax to pay, ultimately. Very difficult to correct all of that. Far better to have paid and got a little bit of advice, and it's the same with the trust, to get a bit of advice, set it up right in the first instance, then try and yeah. fix it later. Absolutely. It's one of the things you see, you know, people will say, oh, it costs so much to set these trusts up and what have you, but it only takes one little thing. I've had a couple instances of myself in the last 12 months, and I... And I didn't have it set up myself. <laughs> and here I am. I know people like yourself, Janet. And um, and uh, yeah, so I've had some you know, harsh lessons myself with that. So it certainly yeah, it's p- paid up front. You know, put into your expenses when you first start out as an investor, and um, and you'll protect. You could protect yourself for the unknown, which could be thousands and tens of thousands of dollars later on. And it might not just be, it might not just be about you. It could be about your children. And we're seeing a lot of parents help their children and we want their money to go from trust to trust because mm. if you if a parent's got some money and they put it in either a family trust or they channeled it from uh, an investment or rental trust through to a family trust then they want to they want that trust to lend money on under loan agreements to a child's trust so the child can go out and buy themselves a home and of course the whole purpose for doing that is if the child gets into trouble or if they're in a relationship and that breaks down We want to make sure that the deposit gets Mm. back into the parents' trust so, you know, it can be recycled. I mean, people are all entitled to a couple of try or something in life, so we (laughs) want to make sure that the money's there for the second attempt. (laughs) Absolutely, yeah, definitely. You know, we try and look after our particular kids, so let's do that properly for them, you know, Mm. as well, and how it's structured and set up. So down to your your level, your job sort of is, I guess, um, you know, why is a professional trustee so important? What's the, you know, tell us about the professional trustee. Well, providing the professional trustee's got the right knowledge bases, law, accounting and tax, and providing that they actually do their job, and what I mean by that is they're active. They don't sign anything that's put in front of them. Uh, They think about the decisions that have got to be made, and they've got some street smarts. They can keep a trust out of trouble. As human beings, we make 
the best decisions that we can with the knowledge that we've got. And that applies to everything, not just to trusts. But our knowledge, of course, is limited because we're limited by only the knowledge that we've got in our heads. So when you've got a professional trustee on board that's got more knowledge than you or knowledge in a different area than you, and you join with them and you make your decisions jointly, then you get a much better outcome. So professional trustees, they've, uh, you know, they'll be aware of the current law. They'll be aware most definitely of the case law that's coming through. They certainly should be. And they should be really applying all of the law, all of their knowledge and their experience, together with the street smarts that they, that they should have, to actually do the right thing. For us, uh, we're going to go over that a bit more in depth on the 29th of July. There's an event that I've been asked to speak at, and we'll go over uh, different cases and things that are really pertinent to trustees. By the way, if you want to attend that, I suggest you get hold of Mark, give him a call or a quick email, and he'll be able to give you full details on that. Yeah, great stuff. Looking forward to uh, that. It's an an Auckland event, so sorry if you aren't in Auckland, unless you want to make a trip up. Um, So... So part of your job is when uh, you, know, you see an S and P agreement come through for a property. You know, why do you have to make the decision? And I suppose you've covered a little bit of that just then. Uh, or in some cases, I believe you can't even stop them making the decision uh, when purchasing a property. Absolutely. So the um, the majority of trustees, again in New Zealand, the majority of them uh, mandate that trustees' decisions should be joint. So that means that all the trustees need to be acting unanimously. So we say, and I, and I, uh, I explain this in my Family Trust 101 book, which is available from, uh, from our practice and from book calls, well, we say that uh, you should follow the three Ds. So that is uh, discuss, decide, and document together. And, of course, it goes back to the fact that the professional trustee will have, in some areas, more knowledge than you. I, the laws, for example and the risks that might be involved in a transaction. And they'll also have what I call industry knowledge. So you frequently, when your ear is uh, you know, close to the ground, you'll frequently be in possession of knowledge which isn't public. An example of that is, um, as a client a couple of years ago, gave me a, about two inches worth of paper on a Friday and told me that this transaction was settling that afternoon. And I explained that I needed to read those papers because as a trustee, you're joint and severally liable. To which they said, well, our lawyers read them, so we would do assign them. And again, my answer was no, I'm going to be raising loans here. I've got to read them and understand them. So let me have a look at it. It turned out their lawyer, i.e. they're the purchaser, the purchaser trust, their lawyer was actually the vendor's lawyer. (laughs) And it also turned out that what they were purchasing was really empty airspace. So I declined to sign those documents. And there was a bit of um, toing and throwing, and professional trustees, look, they've got to have big shoulders. They've got to have big heart and big shoulders. And at times, you have to stand in front of a client to do the right thing. So I declined to, to sign those papers. And a couple of weeks later, and despite the fact that I was yelled at quite loudly, a couple of <laughs> weeks later, that client sent me an email. And I opened the email, and I had two words Thank you. And that is because if I had signed that, they would have been several hundred down the drain. That was a blue chip case. So if they'd had an independent trustee, these people, maybe that might have been the next door neighbour, who would have just signed anything put in front of them. Because, you know, that's the sort of thing you do as a neighbour and as a good mate. Mm. They would have been, you know, they would have been really down on their um, on their funds. So that's the worth of a professional trustee to to understand what needs to be done to do the right job uh, when it needs to be done. Great, great case there, Janet. Um, just on the note, on the uh, flip side of that, do you ever ever uh, have you ever, ever had anyone come back and say you shouldn't have signed it because I got a dud deal? And where, where's, your, where's your responsibility? <laughs> And where's your responsibility well, lie for that? Well, touch wood. <laughs> I've, I've been doing this work for 29 years now, and I haven't. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you can only look at what you look at, and you, it's still you're there. Well, you can well, only only look at the facts that are in front of you. But as a professional trustee, because you see so many transactions, we would see about three thousand a year. You get a good feel, and you get a good feel for when you don't know something. So you'll look at it and you go, well, I know that I don't know this and uh, or I don't know what I don't know and I want a second opinion. And I'm really lucky here. I'm surrounded by uh, really professional people in our firm who've got great knowledge bases and I can go to them and say, 
what do you think about this? I'm a bit concerned about this. Could you cast your eyes over it? So good benefits for having uh, mm. having the professional trustee here. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Dead right. Um, great. So so just moving or including what we're sort of just speaking about, then when an investor comes to you and you look at their sale and purchase agreement, uh, what's the process you run through? Yeah, well, we call it um, – we call it 42 steps to heaven in our trustee <laughs> services division and clients don't see all this work because it happens behind the scenes and that's why we generally need a good hour to actually settle the transaction. But first we check the agreement for sale and purchase is in the correct name and that's amazing how often that isn't the case. Mm. And then we check that the right documentation is being put in place, i.e. the resolutions and we also check that We've got major, if it's if it's a trustee company that's acting as a trustee, we check that there's company registration uh, resolutions, i.e. major transaction resolutions. We check that there's trustee resolutions sitting there as well. And by the way, this is for buy or sell. And uh, then we check what's going to happen to the funds. You know, are we picking up funds on mortgage? And if we are, then we need to do asset and liability uh, ratio checks. And if we're selling, then we want to know what's happening with the sell proceeds because, after all, they belong to... They actually belong to the trust, so we need to know what's going on there. And all of that's really important because you would think, well, surely real estate agents would know that. But for an article is about to go to the press uh, in the next couple of weeks. That will be, I'm under embargo at the moment, but that's um, that will be released. And that shows very clearly what can happen when the right people aren't involved in a transaction. And it's a bit of a carnage. Mm. Yeah, something as you said, real estate agents should pick up, but I know they don't. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, if it has a, a company or a trust on there, they should be doing the research and make sure every single person signs it. If there's six people involved, all six have to sign it. I'm just going through one there, it's three, one in Auckland, one um, I think is in, in the Waikato, and one in Australia. Mm. So we have to get it signed by all three parties, one of them is very sick. But, um, yeah, but just it's just what you need legally, or I guess the um, you know the contract can be cancelled at any time. I imagine would be the case. Absolutely. Well, especially in a hot market, and we're in a mm. hot real estate market most definitely here in Auckland, and we just recently had a case whereby uh, we'll use the name Smith. So Mr. and Mrs. Smith and a third trustee was meant to sign an agreement. Mr. and Mrs. Smith signed it as uh, as purchases, and of course the vendor got a better offer. And so the vendor asserted that they didn't have a binding contract. And as a result, they were able to take that better offer. Mr. Mm. and Mrs. Smith lucked out. Now, I'm sure that there could have been a bit of a case made for specific performance and there could have been some legal hoops jumped through. But at the end of the day, who needs the grief? All they needed to do was get the third trustee mm. to sign the agreement and it would have been binding. Yeah, absolutely. And professional trustees pick that up because professional trustees like to be the last party to sign any legal document. And that's one of the reasons why they're counting those signatures and checking that and cross-checking that everything has been done correctly. Great stuff, thanks, Janet. Um, so, so, what laws then should an investor be aware of when either setting up a trust or choosing their professional trustee? Uh, I.e., you know, we spoke about sham. How do you avoid having a sham trust? Mm. Well, I think there's some things that uh, that you should definitely do each and every year. You should make sure that you've um, that you have a meeting with your professional trustee. And that can either be by phone or in person or maybe Skype. And uh, then the professional trustee should really be directing what needs to happen. So they'll be doing things like documenting the annual trustee meeting. And again, I do go through this checklist in my Family Trust 101 book. But document the uh, annual trustee meeting. And at that annual trustee meeting, you'll be discussing what the assets and liabilities are of the trust and where the trust is really going to sit in the next year. You'll be looking at the financial statements that are prepared each year and reviewing that against all the documents that you've got on file. You'll be looking at uh, insurances, making sure that they're up to date and professional contacts and beneficiary registers. And, of course, most importantly, which a lot of people forget, you'll be looking at the gifting. Because people think once they've moved an asset into a trust, that's the end of it. But it usually isn't because advances are being made uh, further to the trust. And frequently loans are being made from the trust to maybe investor trust or renter trust or possibly a company. So that's important to uh, for the professional trustee to be going through that. And if that is done and documented, it's incredibly difficult for sham trust allegations to be successfully made. That won't stop them being made, those allegations, but to be successfully uh, seen through 
is quite difficult. And in today's world where we're getting more and more audits happening, uh, not only on, on trust clients but uh, on, all, on all sorts of uh, clients engaging in different transactions, the trust is very important to ensure that that administration work and that trustee function is actually met. And I think under our latest budget, the audits will increase, especially for property clients. So if you're going to set a trust up, A, do it right, and B, run it right. It's your insurance policy after all, so mm. just get it sorted. It's um, it's not difficult when you've got a professional trustee on board because they've got a great emphasis, of course, to see that that trust is right. They've got their, they, they clearly want to do that for their client, but they've got their reputation uh, to be thinking about as well, and they want to make sure that there's no negative press out there about them, so they want to make sure it's right. Mm. And if you're in a situation where things aren't quite right in your trust or you're, you're a bit doubtful about it, then... You know, push your trust through uh, through a service like what we offer. We call it the Trustee Rescue Service, where we have a good look for you and uh, just tell you what what you might be doing to uh, get things right. Great stuff. Um, you know, we, we talk about you know, having our team of experts when we talk to groups of people, and and it's obviously you know very important to have your, your solicitor and your accountant and your in your great real estate or finder or whatever it might be. Um, but having a professional trustee is obviously one of the the key the key points that. I suppose gets a lot of those professionals brought together in one place and and knows what you're trying to achieve when you are, you know you have got your goals. So if you're serious about investing, whether it's a buy and hold long term or trading, um, and you are going to buy a few properties. Uh, it obviously, pays to have it set up and structurally um, set up well. Um, so Jen, Jen, it's uh, obviously an expert in the field. I believe you were what, trustee of the year a couple of years ago. Was it? Absolutely, right. we we yeah, the pretty proud moment for me. We uh, we won the uh, inaugural award uh, bestowed by the New Zealand Trustee Association for Corporate Trustee of New Zealand, and what that means in in, um, in everyday terms is simply that we've been judged by our peers and found that our trust practices. Uh, Pretty damn good, I think. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, it's I'm to be feeling pr- something to be proud of. I'm feeling very, very proud <laughs> yeah. of that. It means that we're doing the right thing by our trust clients for right. sure. Great, and you can obviously get hold of Janet at um, gra.co.nz. Mm, or, you, or you can, uh, yeah, you can email me. Uh, pretty simple email address: jx at gra.co.nz. You can call me at the office: o nine five double two. 7955 and I don't mind taking calls either on my cell phone if I can help you 021 439 and of course anybody here at Gilligan Row can uh, can get hold of me as well if you want to contact your client service manager here uh, they'll gladly push you through to our division as well and we'll try and help you. Great any um, any final comments or tips for uh, anyone out there listening? Okay so final tips first off build the right team of experts uh, around you Secondly, set up the trust correctly, and then uh, finally, run the trust correctly. If you're not going to do those things, then don't bother at all. Your trust is an insurance policy really for your future. Obviously, uh, information is in my book, is in my Family Trust 101 book, and uh, as I said before, I'm going to go into more detail at that event on the 29th. 29th of this month, that's next week here in Auckland. So get hold of Mark if you are interested in attending that. And good luck, everybody, with um, with building your trust and running it right. Great stuff. Hey, thank you very much for your time, uh, Janet. I know you're a busy lady. You're uh, happy to get back there and you know carry on doing your professional trustee role. So thanks very much again. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Mark. So we hope you enjoyed today's podcast with Janet. Um, obviously, she is extremely knowledgeable. Uh, runs one of the the better companies in uh, in the country regarding professional trustees and, and trusts. So, if you want to get hold of her, um, the details are on the website. She commented on it before. And until next week, uh, have a great week, and we'll see you again shortly. <laughs>